Good morning. <coughs> oh, the voice is going to start already. That's what I get for hanging around half the night and not talking. I got to get my voice warmed up again. Uh, so uh, we're going to head into chapter three this morning and see about uh, the man, uh, the uh, this conspiracy against the Jews. It's uh, the uh, theme of the entire book of Esther and how God placed Esther and Mordecai in the right spot at the right time uh, to fulfill this need of uh, saving the Jews. Once again, uh, if, you're watch, if you're in my class on Daniel, I'm talking a little bit about how Satan has set up time and time again, has done his very best to try to stop the Jews uh, from Jesus that were being born. And this is just another example of, uh, of uh, Satan's uh, idea to try to stop Jesus from ever being born. Let's start with a word of prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, oh, Lord, we praise you and thank you, Lord, that uh, you are one step ahead of uh, through an entire history of making sure that the, uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was born and that he came to save us all from our sins. We praise you and we thank you so much, Lord. Uh, for that, uh, the, all the all the time and trouble you went through to make sure that that uh, came to pass. And we praise you. We give you all the thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, he must really, really love us. He spent, you know, God wants it, us to to be his children so badly that look at, look at all the things that we study and all the times that Jesus and uh, that God has uh, made arrangements to make sure that the ultimate plan, uh, his goal of getting us to uh, heaven uh, was fulfilled. Even with all the obstacles that uh, Satan tries to throw in his way, he's always one step ahead. And we're gonna see that, uh, we're gonna call this the plot or the conspiracy. I kinda like to call it the plot. Uh, this is the setup and how God is gonna use uh, Esther to, uh, to save the day. And the Jews to this day celebrate this uh, this uh, this salvation, and maybe we'll talk about that more towards the end. But it's a holiday that's in February called Purim. If you want to look it up, uh, it's, uh, it's celebrated every year, and it's about this story. And it's about how Esther saved the Jewish nation from a uh, certain destruction. So let's uh, get on with some verses. And uh, get my uh, first thing up here. I'm just going to read through uh, the book of uh, the chapter, uh, the chapter of uh, three. It's only 15 verses. So I plan on doing the whole thing uh, to this morning. Uh, and, it's, and I call it the setup because it's not uh, even the entire story. We're going to spend the next three chapters pretty much uh, playing this story out. Well, it's kind of interesting how it develops. And uh, I got some correlating passages in the Bible that I'm going to share tonight that will show that uh, that this playbook was played out before. And you got to wonder how much of it might have already been known by some of the players uh, in this conspiracy. Uh, I'll let you decide for yourself. I'll just show you the evidence. So reading through Esther ch uh, chapter 3. After these things... Actually, since I'm doing it this way, let's make it a little easier to read. And let's use uh, this one here instead. I'll accept that I'm going to have a problem with my picture. Let's see if I can fix that real quick. Let's see how that one looks. That might work a little bit more. I'm going to go more up. They don't chop my head off. Okay, that works. That's a little bit easier to read. Okay. Verse 1, after these things did King uh, Xerxes promote Haman, the son of uh, Hamadadath, the Agatite, 
and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. Uh, this Haman was somebody who was in the court, and I guess he was going to be, uh, the king felt that uh, he deserved to be promoted. Now, this particular promotion is going to come with uh, some benefits for Haman, uh, but uh, like a lot of uh, men who get into power, sometimes power goes to your head, and you uh, use it to uh, and abuse it, and we're going to see that in this story. To this day, Haman is a word that I don't think that any young Jewish boy has ever been named. <laughs> It's kind of like Jezebel. I'm sure that no young lady has ever been named Jezebel. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Now I see this verse as a, uh, some people say, well, you know, what's the big deal? He's only, you know, that's just going to bow to him. And as you see going through here, it's going to cause a lot of problems for Mordecai. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why trigress the uh, king's commandment? So he's going against the king's commandment here. Great lesson here, though. Now it came to pass when they spoke daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand. For he had told them that he was a Jew. Now, I think that's an important uh, aspect right there, is that... Uh, you know, as it says in, in Romans 13, we're supposed to obey uh, the, our government and the people put it appointed over us as long as it doesn't go against God's law. And I think that's an important distinction. And of course, going back to this particular time frame, uh, that uh, you know, we're still going on the, the, the law, uh, the Ten Commandments. And it, uh, one of the first commandment is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so... Uh, Haman, I mean, uh, Mordecai might have seen this as more of a uh, worship uh, to a uh, man rather than God. And that, might could, that could have been the reason, not sure, or it might have been just pride, but uh, we'll continue on. Verse 5, and when Haman saw that Mordecai <coughs> bowed not, Nor did him reverence, and I think it's the reverence part that was more than anything. Then was Haman full of wrath. He thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of, of Mordecai, wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes, even the people of Mordecai. In the first month, that is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Xerxes, they cast pure that is the lot before Haman from day to day, from month to month, and the twelfth month, that is the month Adar. This is like rolling dice. Uh, I saw it in a movie one time. What it basically is, is that uh, uh, the, uh, Haman went to the uh, soothsayers and the magicians of that time. And they basically kind of rolled these uh, uh, dice out to try to pick the perfect day to do this, that it would be that the gods, their gods, would shine on them. Uh, and uh, we're going to see that uh, Haman doesn't get his, uh, his gods didn't uh, pan out the way he thought they would. <laughs> and Haman said unto King Xerxes, There was a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people, and neither keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. Notice Haman here is not saying who the people are. He just says people. And I think he's kind of misleading the uh, the uh, king a little bit, because what's uh, you know I remember up to this point that Mordecai uh, that uh, the king loves uh, Esther, and he doesn't know at this point that Esther is Jewish, but I, but also uh, Haman probably doesn't know that either. And it's kind of interesting how this story develops as you'll see going forward. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business, to bring it into the king's treasures. So here Haman, I guess he's a pretty wealthy man too, uh, was willing to pay uh, to have these people eliminated, basically put a bounty on their head. <clears throat> and the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadath, the Agatite, uh, the Jews' enemy. And uh, whenever the king's ring was like, uh, if you had control of the king's ring, basically you could write your own laws and people had to obey them. 
And so this was a big deal to give somebody a ring. <laughs> if you remember that uh, all the way back uh, in Joseph's story, I didn't get that one today. I just thought of it. Uh, but the king gave him the ring to give him control. Uh, he could do anything up to the, the, you know, the Pharaoh at that time gave Joseph, but Joseph was a responsible person and used it properly. And you see towards the end of this story that uh, uh, Mordecai is also going to be uh, faithful to God's word and uh, do it uh, properly. Uh, but here, uh, Haman has uh, kind of swindled the, the king into getting this ring, and now he's going to use it to try to destroy the Jews. Verse 11. And the king said unto Haman, the silver is given to thee, uh, the people also to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. <clears throat> then were the king's scribes called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants, and to the governors that were over every providence, and to the rulers of every people of every providence according to the written thereof, and to every people after their language. In the name of King Xerxes was it written and sealed with the king's ring. And once something in uh, the Persian government got sealed with the king's ring, I'm going to show you a verse to confirm this, uh, <clears throat> that uh, there was no way within the Persian uh, uh, tradition that it could be overturned, even by the king. And the letters were sent by post unto all of the king's providences to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, and one day, even until the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. A copy of the written for a commandment is to be given every providence, was published unto all people that they should be ready against that day. <clears throat> the post went out being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan, the palace, and the king and Haman sat down to drink. But the city Shushan was perplexed. Now that's the chapter, and and so we got it's pretty much set in stone now uh, that uh, Haman has got his way, and he's going to kill all the Jews. And this all started because of a hatred uh, for Mordecai. Uh, but I think in general Haman uh, was being uh, led by Satan more or less to try to again uh, thwart the plans of God uh, to have the Jewish nation bring the Messiah. But let's look at a few of these uh, verses. I couldn't help but think about when I saw this. Uh, when I saw this, like uh, of another uh, another story, very very similar. And I'm going to read through it, uh, certain parts of it. Uh, and that's over in Daniel. There's two stories I'm going to read. One is the first one. It's about three young men, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I want to show an example of uh, of when when not to obey what the king says, and that God will protect you. Over in Daniel 3, 1. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar, the king made... <clears throat> the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in a plain of Dura in the providence of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And the princes, and the governors, and the captains, and the judges, and the treasurers, and the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud to you, uh, it is commanded, O people, nations and tongues. I'm going to jump down to verse 6. And uh, it, uh, it continues on to talk about what people are supposed to do when they hear uh, music playing. And whosoever shall, uh, falleth not down to worship shall the same hour be cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, Palmistry and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Set for three people. All, all the, the entire nation bowed down. So you can imagine you got the field, uh, you know, probably 
many thousands of people all bowing down to this golden statue that the king had ordered, uh, except for three people. And that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So I'm going to jump down to verse 12 uh, when it's found out that they did not bow in, in front of the king's image. Then there are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image what thou hast set up. And jumping down to verse 16, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee on this matter. The king had asked them why they didn't bow, and, they, and basically they said, this is their answer. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And if you continue on with the story, most of us have heard it at least once or twice, uh, that uh, uh, basically uh, God protected them in that furnace and they came out without, a, without even a hair in their head singed. So it's a good example of how God protected those uh, when, they, uh, when they obeyed. And I see the same thing happening here. And I uh, thought I'd bring up a, a, uh, just a few things of... Uh, because I have a feeling that, uh, uh, I'm going to go back to a different drawing. I have a feeling that uh, uh, this particular, uh, I, I wanted to kind of show these slides, but this is a good time to show them about the, uh, the general, uh, right now we're in Esther, which is a, uh, uh, the, the Persian rule, uh, this slide here kind of gives you a really brief, uh, uh, an overview of, uh, of the Babylonian exile and, and then it moves into the Persian rule, which we're in right now. And you can see here on this chart uh, that uh, you know, we were just talking about Daniel. Daniel and uh, Mordecai's great-grandfather. And I want to kind of show this a little bit. I, I had talked about it once before when we talked about Mordecai, but over in Esther 2, 2 5, and 6. Now in Shushan the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity which had been carried away from Janachiah, king of Judea, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. <clears throat> and when you jump over to uh, Daniel uh, 6 1. No, that's something different. <clears throat> so, in our chart here, you see that uh, that, that happened in 607 BC. Uh, we we're at the beginning of our timeline. And, it, uh, <clears throat> and then during that Babylonian rule, Persia conquered uh, Babylon in 540 BC. And that's when Darius came in on the scene. And I want to kind of show that, I think I forgot to put a verse in here. Kind of show a timeline of... Uh, <clears throat> Well, we know that uh, this guy Kish, uh, who would be uh, uh, came in came in, in to Babylonian exile. Dang it, my throat. With Daniel, and what I'm trying to drive at is that uh, there's a good chance that uh, Mordecai uh, was well aware of what happened with Daniel on those two, on these two instances. I'm going to show you the second one here in a minute, and was well aware and was and was afraid. Or, or knew that God uh, would would uh, protect him uh, during this time frame from being uh, for being loyal to the Lord and not bowing down uh, to this Haman because it was a uh, law against the Jews. So I'm I'm trying to show that I believe that Mordecai probably knew about what Daniel was going on with Daniel since his great grandfather 
was taken away to Babylon at the same time frame as Daniel. And he probably was even around uh, watching some of this stuff going on. It doesn't talk about Kish much uh, in, except we have this one verse in Esther that tells us that uh, that uh, Kish went to Babylon in the first deportation, which is the same one that Daniel went in. So I'm speculating a little bit, but I can see that it's only four generations. So I want a short timeline. And so that was 607 BC. And we saw in that verse how that uh, uh, from Mordecai, it went to, uh, uh, so his great grandfather was Kish. He was 605 BC. <clears throat> and he had a son named Shimei. So that was probably about, uh, I'm, I'm guessing about 30 years per uh, generation here. Uh, so Shimei, so that was 607. So that would put Shimei somewhere in the 575 BC time frame. And then we have that JR, uh, who was, uh, say that he had his son when he was about 30. Uh, could have been, could have been 22. Uh, either way, it would have still worked out. And that would end up being about 545 BC. And so that would put Mordecai, and if JR was, say, about 30 ish when he had Mordecai, that would put Mordecai's birth somewhere around 515 BC. So I'm trying to show that uh, there's definitely a correlation between um, uh, Monica, uh, Mordecai and Kish, and it's a good chance that we're talking about the same Kish here uh, that was in Babylon. So he could definitely could have seen the uh, situation with Daniel. And I got this nice little chart here. Let me put me down at the bottom. <clears throat> it kind of shows you that a little bit better. Uh, so you got here, they got uh, Daniel goes from about 605 BC to about 536 BC. So just about the time Daniel was finishing up uh, his ministry was when Cyrus came in. And Cyrus uh, was the beginning of the Persian Empire. That was about 536 BC. So shortly after that, that uh, probably somewhere around here is when uh, Mordecai was born. Uh, he grew up uh, during this time frame, probably in the Darius, uh, hearing stories from his father about the, uh, uh, the captivity and the Babylonian Empire. Uh, and about Daniel and all the famous stories about that, I can see it. And uh, he ends up getting uh, this uh, this daughter to take care of uh, Queen, uh, who ends up being Queen Esther. And that happens over here in Xerxes. Uh, so I kind of give you a little timeline here of some of the books of the Bible. And I had one more slide. This one might be a little bit harder to see. Uh, I'm going to put myself back up at the top again. But right here is where uh, Esther became queen. Uh, so you can see, uh, coming back to Cyrus, uh, <clears throat> this is about where uh, Cyrus took over in 539 BC. And it was right through this time frame that, uh, that Daniel was still around. And we can see that uh, as it progressed, uh, we come up here to... Uh, Let's see. Uh, well, Queen Vestai was uh, was uh, was deported, rejected right here at 483 BC, and so it was shortly after that that Esther was chosen as queen. That's it, under Xerxes. That's right here. And this whole time frame is only about uh, oh 60 to 80 years. So you can see it's quite plausible. Uh, that, uh, that Mordecai was quite familiar with what happened in the Babylonian Empire. <clears throat> so, uh, back to some verses. So that's my little timeline figure, and I, I probably should have started off the book with that, but I'll give you a kind of an idea of what we're looking at here. And... Uh, what I want to talk about too is that uh, what I found interesting, interesting about this whole Esther thing is that uh, when I was, was thinking back to the whole story of Daniel, uh, it really got me thinking about uh, what happened to Daniel himself. Now, I remember during the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thing, Daniel was nowhere around. And I see that as a symbol, a symbol of the... Uh, 
Babylonian uh, of the uh, of the uh, rapture, actually, because Daniel wasn't around uh, during that time frame. And so those other guys plotted uh, to turn those three guys in because there's actually a storyline behind that because Daniel was given uh, power over. This is what I wanted to show next. Daniel was actually put in charge of what I believe might be alluded to in Esther 1.1. And so in Daniel 6.1, We see this comment about, uh, and you saw where uh, Darius was the first Persian uh, uh, emperor. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes because an excellent spirit was in him and the king thought to be set him over the whole realm. And so we have this mention about the, the princes being put over the, and it's funny that Xerxes has the same thing over in Esther. And here's Esther 1.1. 1, 1. Now it came to pass in the days of Xerxes, this is Xerxes who reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over a hundred uh, 27 provinces. So the the, uh, the approximate number of princes equals the number of provinces that Darius first set up, and now Xerxes is over the same number. So I'm sure that there was some animosity between uh, between the Jews and the uh, Persians. I'm thinking at this time frame because Daniel was actually in charge of all those, and now here we have uh, again uh, a period of time coming up that uh, we're going to see that uh, Haman maybe might have been well aware of this whole thing and really wanted to eliminate the Jews so that that didn't happen again. Maybe he was concerned, uh, but uh, or just a general hatred of the Jews, which was probably embedded in him by uh, Satan himself. So over in Daniel, we have it spelled out here, uh, during Daniel's <coughs> reign, when he was over this 120 provinces, then the presidents and the priests, princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they couldn't find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to to the king and said thus unto the king, King Darius, live forever. Now this is going to sound really familiar to what we're talking about here. Because Haman just did the same thing, basically. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes and the councilors and the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish this decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. This is that uh, uh, correlation of that rule that uh, once a decree is made, it cannot be changed ever. <clears throat> Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows, being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. So there, right there, you see that he was disobeying the king's order about not praying to any other gods except him. A lot of uh, rulers back then considered themselves gods. Uh, verse 611 here in Daniel then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any God or man within 30 days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? And the king answered and said, That thing is true according to the law of Medes and Persians, which altereth not. <clears throat> then answered they and said before the king, that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judea, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, 
by making his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he had heard these words, was sore displeased and with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the king, the going down of the sun to deliver him. Uh, and that story there, he had till the uh, till sunset uh, to uh, to put Daniel into the lion's den. And I'll stop there because that, uh, that basically uh, tells us. Uh, so I showed the, the kind of the correlation between what's going on here and Esther and what happened in Daniel. We'll continue this story tomorrow uh, with the uh, next chapter, chapter four, which uh, is more about the actual uh, uh, <coughs> the actual time frame that uh, Haman is going to try to uh, accomplish this and what happens. And so uh, let's end with a prayer. Oh, thank you, Lord, so much for this time. We get to look in your words, Lord. And it's amazing to me, Lord, how much you're uh, Yeah, even when we're not even necessarily uh, looking for it, you're, you're there always looking out for us. And I know that for sure, Lord, that you protect us and you're, uh, you keep your sights uh, ahead of time to ensure that we're protected and that we uh, are always ready uh, for whatever's going to come our way. We give you praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, it's funny, it kind of reminds me of my own uh, background a little bit is that when you're in uh, the pleasure of the Lord, uh, that uh, all paths come together uh, for good. And that uh, I, I, I've seen that same thing in, in smaller ways happen in my own life. So it's a, a real pleasure. <clears throat> and by the way, I've. Uh, I got a new picture for the church, so I hope you like it. Uh, <coughs> here's what it's going to look like. I kind of uh, been talking to a few folks, and this is what we decided upon. So this will be our new uh, title page picture. Uh, the old one we had up here before was actually probably about 10 years old uh, or close to it because uh, you notice the front doors were different then. So uh, have a great day, and we will talk to you again tomorrow.